Native American tribes, spread across the vast expanse of North America, held a rich tapestry of traditions and customs, among which marriage rituals held a significant place. Some of these are said to be the most fascinating and unique traditions throughout human history. The tribes of the Arctic region, such as the Inuit, had a tradition of wife lending, known as Paul Raider. This custom, while shocking to many outside observers, served a practical purpose within the context of Inuit society. In the harsh Arctic environment, survival often depended on cooperation and mutual support among community members. Hunting, the primary means of sustenance, was a dangerous and unpredictable endeavor. If a hunter was injured or killed, his family would be left vulnerable. To lower this risk, the Inuit developed the custom of Paul Racher. In this practice, a man would lend his wife to a guest or a neighbor, creating a bond of obligation and gratitude. The wife would provide domestic services, and in some cases, sexual companionship. This was not considered adultery, but rather a social duty and a means of strengthening community ties. While the practice of Paul Racher may seem unusual, it is essential to understand it within the context of Inuit culture. The Inuit had a fundamentally different view of marriage and sexuality compared to many Western societies. They saw these aspects of life as fluid rather than fixed, and their social norms reflected this view. The Inuit believed in the concept of Inua, a life force or spirit that resides in all beings. This belief led to a greater acceptance of fluid social and sexual roles. A man could become a woman, a woman could become a man, and sexual relationships could be formed and dissolved with relative ease. Despite its practical benefits, Paul Racher was not without its controversies. The practice was often misinterpreted by outsiders, leading to misunderstandings and conflicts. However, for the Inuit, it was a vital part of their social fabric, helping them survive in one of the world's harshest environments. The practice of Paul Racher began to decline with the arrival of Christian missionaries in the 19th and 20th centuries. If a couple in the Inuit tribe decided to separate, they would simply stop living together and their community would recognize their decision without any formal proceedings. And maybe the most interesting part about the Inuit tribe is the way they resolve conflicts inside or outside of marriage. Instead of physical confrontation or formal legal proceedings, disputes are often resolved through song duels, where each party presents their case in a public performance. In these duels, the disputing parties would compose sarcastic and humorous songs about each other, which they would then perform in front of the community. The winner was determined by the audience's reaction, and the conflict was considered resolved. Seems like we have quite a lot to learn from them on the subject of how to resolve issues. The Choctaw tribe, originally hailing from the southeastern United States, had a unique marital ritual. Central to this ritual was an act where the groom would shoot an arrow into the bride's house. The shooting of the arrow was a physical representation of the groom's intentions to marry the bride. The arrow, always crafted by the groom himself, symbolized his strength, skill, and determination, qualities expected of a Choctaw man. The bride's house, on the other hand, represented her world and family. By shooting an arrow into it, the groom was symbolically entering her world and declaring his intent to become part of her family. This was a bold, public declaration of his commitment, and it was seen as a brave and honorable act. The act of shooting the arrow was not taken lightly. It required careful preparation and was carried out with great dignity. The groom would spend considerable time crafting the perfect arrow, often seeking the guidance of older, experienced men in the tribe. The act of shooting the arrow also had a practical aspect. The groom was expected to demonstrate his physical prowess and accuracy. The ability to hit the target, which was often a specific part of the bride's house, was seen as a testament to the groom's hunting skills and general fitness. This was crucial in a society where hunting was a significant part of life and a key survival skill. The bride and her family would watch this display, and a successful shot was often met with approval and celebration. However, if the groom missed his target, it was seen as a bad omen, and the marriage could be called off. This added a layer of tension and excitement to the ritual, making it a community event that everyone looked forward to. The arrow itself was not retrieved immediately. It was left in the bride's house for a certain period, typically until the wedding ceremony. This served as a constant reminder of the groom's commitment and the impending marriage, being also believed to bring good luck to the bride's family and ward off evil spirits. Moving on to one of the most unusual Native American marriage traditions was the Hopi tradition of the bride's wedding garment. The bride-to-be would spend months weaving a wedding robe, a process overseen by the women of the tribe. This garment, intricately woven with symbols and designs, was not only her wedding dress, but also her burial shroud. The process begins with the women shearing wool from sheep, which they then clean, card, and spin into yarn. The weaving of the robe is a labor-intensive task, being traditionally woven on a Pueblo loom, a vertical frame with the warp stretched vertically, a technique that has been used by the Hopi for centuries. 
The completed wedding robe is a symbol of marital unity and the shared responsibilities between husband and wife. It is used in the wedding ceremony, and later, it serves a dual purpose as a burial shroud, symbolizing the lifelong commitment of marriage in Hopi culture. The Hopi wedding ceremony itself is a multi-day event, and the bride's wedding robe plays a crucial role. On the first day, the bride's hair is washed and styled by her mother-in-law, a tradition known as Lala Kanto, symbolizing her acceptance into the groom's family and officially becoming a woman. The bride's hair is then styled into a figure known as butterfly whorls, a traditional Hopi hairstyle for unmarried women, representing the squash blossom's beauty and fertility. The second day of the wedding is a day of prayer and purification, where the bride and groom are secluded and participate in private rituals. The bride's wedding robe is presented to her on the third day, marking the official start of the wedding ceremony. The bride wears the robe, and the couple is blessed by the elders, signifying their union's sanctity. Although not directly a marital tradition, but a significant and worthy of mention, Hopi tradition is the snake dance, a religious ceremony held every two years in late August. This dance is a prayer for rain, crucial for the Hopi people's agricultural lifestyle. But snake dance is not just a simple dance. Participants handle live snakes, including venomous ones, in their mouths, and the snakes are then released into the wild, believed to carry the prayers for rain to the gods. Among the tribes of the Cherokee, a powerful confederacy of six tribes in the northeastern United States, marriage was often matrilocal. This meant that after marriage, the husband would move to live with the wife's family. This was in stark contrast to many European societies of the time, where the wife would move to live with the husband's family. The Cherokee also had a unique divorce tradition. If a wife wanted to divorce her husband, she simply placed his belongings outside the home, signaling the end of the relationship. To be fair, the Native American tribal customs surrounding divorce are particularly intriguing, so let's discuss these for a minute as well. The Hopi tribe, also from the southwestern United States, had a unique divorce custom. If a Hopi woman wanted a divorce, she would make a thick, coarse garment called a hikimawu and present it to her husband. If he wore it in public, it signified his acceptance of the divorce. On the other hand, among the Navajo tribe in the southwestern United States, divorce was a straightforward process with no social stigma attached. Either spouse could initiate divorce for reasons ranging from infidelity to incompatibility. Once decided, the couple would simply live separately and their community would recognize their decision. Finally, in the Pacific Northwest, the Tlingit tribe had a unique divorce tradition. If a Tlingit woman wished to divorce her husband, she would break a ceremonial water jar in front of witnesses. This public act was a clear signal of her intention to end the marriage. Moving back to marriage traditions, the Blackfoot tribe. The process of marriage began with the proposal, but unlike many Western cultures, where the man traditionally proposes, it was the woman who initiated the proposal in the Blackfoot tribe. This was done indirectly, often through a relative or friend who would give on the woman's intentions to the man. The man, upon receiving the proposal, would then consult with his family. If they approved, he would respond by sending horses to the woman's family as a token of his acceptance. The number of horses given varied, but it was generally understood that a higher number indicated greater wealth and status. Following the acceptance of the proposal and the exchange of gifts, the Blackfoot tribe would proceed with a series of rituals. The first of these was the ceremonial painting of the bride's face. The bride's face was painted by an older, married woman, usually a relative, who was respected within the tribe. This ritual was symbolic of the bride's transition from a girl to a woman, ready to take on the responsibilities of marriage. The bride was then presented with a new name, marking her new status within the tribe. This name was usually chosen by the husband's family and was often related to a significant event or characteristic of the bride. The bride and groom would then participate in a ceremonial exchange of gifts. The groom would give his bride a saddle, and the bride, in return, would present her groom with a pair of leather shoes, indicating her commitment to care for him. The marriage ceremony itself was a simple affair, conducted by a tribal elder, and the ceremony was usually followed by a feast, where the entire tribe would come together to celebrate the couple's union. The morning after the wedding, the bride would rise early to fetch water from a nearby river or stream. This was a symbolic act, representing the bride's commitment to her new role as a wife. The act of fetching water was seen as a woman's duty within the Blackfoot tribe, associated with nurturing and caring for the family. The Creek tribe, also known as the Muscogee, was a Native American nation that resided primarily in the southeastern United States. They had a unique tradition known as marriage by elopement. This practice was not a spontaneous act of love, as the term elopement suggests in today's context, but rather a carefully planned and executed event. The process began with the man expressing his interest in a woman. If the woman reciprocated this interest, 
The man would then consult with his closest male relatives. These relatives, often his brothers or uncles, would play a crucial role in the elopement process. They would be responsible for abducting the woman from her family's home, a task that required careful planning and stealth. This abduction was not a violent act, but was in fact a ceremonial part of the marriage process. The woman was usually aware of the impending abduction and was a willing participant in the process. The event was carefully timed to take place when the woman's family was away from their home, ensuring that the woman could be taken without any resistance or conflict. Once the woman was taken, she would be brought to the man's home where she would become his wife. The couple would then live together, marking the beginning of their married life. The woman's family would typically feign surprise and anger upon discovering her absence, but they were usually aware of the elopement plan. The Creek tribe's marriage by elopement tradition was not without its challenges and controversies. One of the most significant issues was the question of consent. While the woman was typically a willing participant in the elopement, there were instances where she was taken against her will. In such cases, the woman's family could demand her return, leading to potential conflict within the tribe. Another challenge was the risk of inter-clan marriages. The Creek tribe was divided into several clans, each with its own set of customs and traditions. Marriages between members of the same clan were strictly forbidden. To ensure that this rule was not violated, the man's family had to carefully research the woman's lineage before proceeding with the elopement and marriage. The tradition strongly influenced the tribe's population growth. Since marriages were typically arranged at a young age, couples were able to start families early, leading to a steady increase in the tribe's population. This growth was vital for the tribe's survival, especially in times of war or disease when the population was at risk. In the 19th century, the Creek tribe faced significant violent change due to forced relocations and the impact of the American Civil War. The disruption of the tribe's social and political structure made it difficult to maintain traditional practices, leading to a decline in the tradition. However, the tradition of marriage by elopement has not been entirely forgotten. It continues to be remembered and celebrated as a part of the Creek tribe's rich cultural heritage, and if not by many, then by us here, both me writing this and you listening to it, and maybe even sharing it with someone. The Zuni tribe, indigenous to the southwestern United States, had a unique matrimonial tradition known as the cornmeal path. The tradition was a symbolic representation of the journey that the bride and groom would embark upon together in their married life. The ritual began with the bride's family preparing a path made of cornmeal from the bride's home to the groom's home. This path was not merely a physical route, but a symbolic journey, representing the transition from the bride's family to her new life with her husband. Corn, the main ingredient in the cornmeal path, was a staple food for the Zuni people and held a special place in their culture. By using cornmeal to create the path, the Zuni people were acknowledging the vital role that corn played in their lives and expressing their gratitude for its abundance, also symbolizing sustenance and the commitment to provide for one another. The bride, dressed in traditional Zuni attire, would then walk along the cornmeal path to her groom's home. This act signified her willingness to leave her family and join her husband's. It was a solemn and significant journey, marking the beginning of their shared life. The groom, in turn, would wait at his home, ready to receive his bride and start their new life together. It was a tradition that had been passed down through generations, each generation adding its own interpretations and nuances to the practice. Despite changes over time, the core elements of the tradition remained consistent. And now the Native American tribe with the wildest name yet, the Oglala Lakota tribe, is one of the seven sub-tribes of the Great Sioux Nation, native to the Great Plains of North America. The tribe's history dates back to the early 17th century, and the word Oglala translates to to scatter one's own in Lakota language reflecting their nomadic lifestyle. The Oglala Lakota were primarily hunters and gatherers, relying heavily on the American bison for food, clothing, and shelter. Their nomadic lifestyle was assisted by the use of teepees, tents made of bison hides, easily assembled and disassembled tents that could be transported as the tribe moved following bison herds. Leadership was not hereditary but earned through acts of bravery and wisdom. The chiefs were responsible for the welfare of the band and made decisions on when and where to move, hunt, or wage war. The Oglala Lakota has a rich history filled with unique traditions, particularly in the realm of marriage. In the early 19th century, the Oglala Lakota practiced a form of marriage known as bride purchase. This was not a simple transaction, but rather a complex social event with deep symbolic meaning. The groom's family would offer horses, weapons, or other valuable goods to the bride's family as a token of their commitment 
and as a way to forge strong familial ties. The process began with the groom's family sending a respected elder to negotiate the bride price with the bride's family. The elder, known as the Taku Wakan, played a crucial role in these negotiations, ensuring that both families were satisfied with the arrangement. The bride price was not a measure of the bride's worth, but rather a symbol of the groom's ability to provide for his future family. Once the bride price was agreed upon, the groom's family would deliver the goods to the bride's family in a public ceremony, reinforcing the social bonds between the two families. The bride, in turn, would be welcomed into the groom's family, marking the beginning of their life together. Following the bride price ceremony, the Oglala Lakota marriage rites would continue with the preparation of the bride. This was a significant process involving the entire community. The bride would be dressed in a beautifully decorated dress, often made of elk or deer skin, adorned with intricate beadwork and quill embroidery. Simultaneously, the groom would also undergo preparation. He would be expected to demonstrate his hunting skills, as providing food was a primary responsibility of the Oglala Lakota men. The groom would embark on a hunt, often accompanied by other men of the tribe, aiming to bring back a significant game animal. The Oglala Lakota also practiced a tradition known as two kettle, a form of polygamy where a man could marry two sisters. This practice, while not common, was accepted within the society as it was believed to strengthen the familial bonds and ensure harmony within the family unit. These rituals and practices were deeply ingrained in Oglala Lakota society, serving to strengthen community bonds and maintain societal harmony. The Oglala Lakota did not have a formal religious ceremony akin to modern weddings. Instead, the couple would simply start living together, marking the beginning of their married life. This was a pragmatic approach, reflecting the realities of life on the Great Plains, where survival was the primary concern. However, this did not mean that the union was taken lightly. On the contrary, marriage was a serious commitment, with both parties expected to fulfill their respective roles diligently. The husband was the provider and protector, responsible for hunting and defending the family, while the wife was the homemaker, tasked with raising children, preparing food, and maintaining the family's teepee. In the event of a marital dispute, the Oglala Lakota had a unique system of resolution. The couple would be counseled by elders, who would offer wisdom and guidance to help them resolve their issues. If the dispute could not be resolved, divorce was a possibility, though it was not taken lightly. The couple's goods would be divided, and they would return to their respective families. The Oglala Lakota also practiced Leverat and Sororat marriages. In a Leverat marriage, if a man died, his brother would marry his widow, ensuring her and her children's welfare. In a Sororat marriage, if a woman died, her sister would marry her widower, providing continuity for the family unit. In the modern era, many of these traditions have evolved or faded away, influenced by changing societal norms and external pressures. And to end it all, here's the most twisted Native American tradition, the Vision Quest, primarily practiced by the Plains Indians. The Vision Quest was a rite of passage, a transition from childhood to adulthood. This ritual was initiated when a boy reached puberty, the boy would be sent alone into the wilderness without food or water to seek spiritual enlightenment and guidance. The purpose of this ritual was to establish a personal relationship with the spiritual world and to receive a guardian spirit. This spirit would guide the individual throughout his life, offering wisdom and protection. The boy would prepare for the vision quest through a series of purification rituals. These included fasting, sweating, and prayer. Once prepared, he would venture into the wilderness, usually to a high place like a mountain or hilltop. Here, he would sit in solitude for up to four days, praying and meditating, waiting for a vision or dream that would reveal his guardian spirit. Upon receiving a vision, the boy would return to the tribe and recount his experience to the tribal elders or medicine man. The elders would then interpret the vision, deciphering its symbolic meaning and guiding the boy in understanding his spiritual path. This interpretation would often influence the boy's adult name. The guardian spirit revealed in the vision was not only a source of guidance, but also a source of power. It was believed that the spirit granted the individual certain abilities or skills, such as prowess in hunting or warfare, healing abilities, or wisdom in leadership. This spirit became an integral part of the individual's identity, guiding him throughout his life. It was a testament to the deep spiritual connection that these tribes held with the natural world and the spiritual realm a connection that was integral to their identity and survival.